Well, hello there, DFS family. Welcome back to the Sunday School NFL DFS podcast, powered by Fantasy Six Pack. I am your host and typically your winner, uh, Dave Eddy. You can find me on Twitter at Corporal Eddy. I am, of course, joined by my incredibly handsome and very fit co-host, Mr. Patrick Makowski, whom you can find on Twitter at PattyMac33. Now, before we get started, as always, go ahead and do us a quick favor if you have not already and hit that like button. And if for whatever reason you have not subscribed yet, then go ahead and do yourself that favor and hit that subscribe button. If you want to keep a leg up on all your buddies, swing on over to fantasysixpack.net to check out tons of great content. Well, I mean, here I am yet again. I uh, posted a 148 to 138 nail-biting win. I got to tell you, though, Patrick, um, I think people are getting a little bit tired of hearing me talk about all these wins I'm piling up. So I want to change the script a little bit, and I want to um, hear you explain why um, you played Carson Wentz in this pivotal matchup. And I'm especially interested to hear why you didn't stack him or have any correlating players in your lineup at all. So do tell, my friend. Yeah, well, I mean, the first reason why I decided to play Carson Wentz was because last week my co-host was all over that bandwagon on the Wentz with his Hail Mary long shot. Oh, and I, sat there and I, I was all over movie. him with a, with a long shot? I, mean, I like, dude, gotcha. gotcha. I'm like, dude, you know what? How, how nice would it be to beat Dave with one of his own guys that he's calling out that, you know, is, is his Hail Mary. I go, that would just be too sweet to pass up. So I decided, why the hell not? We give it a shot, see what happened. Um, yep, I didn't stack him because I didn't like any of the guys that he had, you know, as his weapons. Um, I didn't put any correlating players on the other side of the ball in the lineup either because I thought there were better matchups elsewhere. Um, and in my opinion, if Jalen Hurt doesn't take over in the second half, then that 10-point win is nothing, um, and we're probably talking something closer to even a tie. Um, but, but yeah, so ultimately, you're right, you won. People are definitely getting sick of hearing your voice. Um, I know <laughs> yeah. <that> the first <laughs> um, But in a nutshell, that's it. I just really wanted to try to beat you with one of your own guys, so – well, I'm sure that a lot of people zoned out during that little rant. So, um, Cliff Notes version, um, Patrick said he's a doofus. So, moving on. <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's it. But enough about that. Let's let's get into this week. There you go. Um, our, another, our another installment of our Virgin Mary question of the week, David. Um, you know, this is one where we take some questions that we get from people that are either new to the DFS world or inexperienced um, and kind of help them understand a little bit some ins and outs of the hobby. So um, this week's question is as follows. When looking at building your stacks, how many players should you play from the same team and which positions should you focus on? Yep, yeah, so, you know, this is a, a pretty basic but important one. So, I mean, stacks, uh, you know, are very important. So, Patrick, you might want to pay attention to this question. Um, I'm you know, my pad out. I'm ready to write it down. You're ready to write it down? Okay, perfect. So, how many players should you play from the same team and which position should you focus on? So, we did kind of cover this a little bit um, in previous weeks. Um, let's start with positions you should focus on. So, me personally... I don't put, um, you know, tight ends in the flex, like I said. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that's going to, you know, limit what you can do just a smidge. But um, we've also talked about stacking running backs. It takes a particular, you know, type running back to be able to stack with your quarterback. So you're looking for, you know, guys that are going to get targets. So, you know, if you don't expect that, you know, that running back is going to get, let's say, bare minimum five targets. Um, then, then he's not an option for you. But tight end, wide receiver, um, running back, all viable. Wide receiver is definitely, you know, the most common, most popular way to go about things. Uh, tight end would probably be, you know, second. And then, you know, running back if it fits. Now, how many players should you play from the same team? 
That varies. Um, it varies on you know the team and on the matchup. At the minimum, you're playing one. Um, if you're playing one, it really doesn't typically make sense to make that a running back. So you know either a wide receiver more often than not, or you know a, a tight end. You could definitely have a running back in there. Um, but if you're just doing a you know a one stack there with your quarterback, probably not the the best route typically to go. You can definitely play two players as well. Um, then wide receiver and tight end um, have to be one option, and then a running back becomes very viable. Now, again, it's typically more common to go wide receiver, tight end, but you know you can throw a running back in there. At that point, that's about where you want to cap it because the odds of you know three guys all going off in the same game are are very little. And while you might you know be able to soak up all of the target share between the three guys, you're not going to be able to win a tournament by, you know, going that route. There's just almost no chance that those three guys are going to all go crazy. So, so one is a minimum wide receiver tight end. Typically two is, is definitely an option um, depending on, you know, how great the matchup is. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get all that though. So could you please repeat it? Yes, of course. So if you're, <laughs> Uh, no, good point. Uh, you know, and for, for me, the way I look at it is, uh, pretty basically the same way. Um, you know, I tend to like my tight ends a little bit more than you do. Yeah, you do. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I look at that wide receiver and that tight end position and whichever Matt, you know, like you get a, a team like the Raiders where Waller is their best pass catching option, you know, which he showed last week. I might not have a receiver in there and Waller might be the only guy that I go in, you know, with the Raiders um, and then a correlating player on the other side of the ball. So it, it's really about the matchup about, um, you know, you get a team like Seattle in a good matchup where you can run Wilson and Metcalf and lock it out there. Um, and then you run another guy back as well. Running backs, like you said, stay away from them for the most part, unless they're a pass catching RB. Um, so yeah, good points, Dave. Well, speaking of pass catching running backs, why don't you uh, lead us in with your core play for the week? Yeah, so uh, I don't know if everybody, you know, our three loyal listeners that we have, uh, they remember back to week two. Um, you know, I had this guy locked in as my devil, um, <laughs> and uh, I had a bunch of a bunch of fancy statistics to back it up, and and I really did some homework on it, and well, you know, I should have known better. Um, because it was against our lowly Detroit Lions, um, and this cat just full out went off, and I'm talking about Aaron Jones, uh, the Green Bay Packers running back. Uh, he's coming in at 7600 bucks this week. Um, you know, in that matchup, the, the dude ended up with 236 total yards and three touchdowns, uh, 48 point six fantasy point now i look back to those notes dave and and they were pretty pretty decent um but we don't have the time and i don't want to relive it any more than i have to um so i'm just going to say this i'm not going to make a mistake again uh the only stat that you need to know in this one is that detroit is dead last in the nfl against opposing running backs uh, yielding almost 33 fantasy points a game. Jones is an absolute must start in this one. Aaron Jones. You could say they're dead last on a lot of things, Patrick. <laughs> uh, any, any way you want to go there, you're fine. You can stack that game with Adams. You can stack that game with Tunyon. You can stack that game with um, Adams and Jones, you can stack that game with Tunyon and Jones. You can stack that game with Adams and Tun. I mean, you can go any route you want there, and you're going to be looking all right. So, Lions are always a good team to target. Um, and this weekend is going to be the weekend where you might be able to do that. So, yeah, but again, to, to the previous question, you know, the Virgin Mary question, you wouldn't want to go and go Rodgers with Jones, Adams, and Tunyon. The odds of all three yeah. of them are just almost impossible to do so that, that's a perfect example of of a way that you know you'd be looking to stack you know two of those three guys um or you could just stack one you know i mean stacking adams with rogers every week is viable 
Um, but against a team like the Lions, that's a perfect kind of matchup where if you want to throw you know, Jones or Tunyon in there, or if you want to be a little bit unique, Jones and Tunyon is going to be a, a less popular stack while still getting you, you know, a lot of the market share there. Um, <clears throat> for me, my core play this week uh, is going to be a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different trick here I'm pulling out of the hat. <clears throat> so most of the time, if not all the time, you know, especially this year, my core play has been a high price stud that's in a smash spot. This week it is quite the opposite because uh, I just don't have 100% confidence in any of the high-priced uh, players this week. So, uh, Brashad Perriman, 3900 bucks, Jets versus the Seahawks. Denzel Mims is going to be out this week, or he probably would have been my core play. So, instead, I turn my attention to Brashad Perriman. I think a lot of people are going to gravitate towards Crowder, um, but, I mean, he's $1,500 higher, and these two have been putting up basically the same numbers over the past month so you know in this matchup you know the volume isn't going to be um, elite but it's certainly there um, because Perriman does lead this team in market share so this play really is actually more about the matchup Um, you know as you probably know Seahawks have been absolutely torched through the air this year they're giving up over 30 points per game to wide receivers Jets are almost certain to be playing catch up so Perriman can be used as a one-off play uh, secondary stack, or of course you could, you know, stack him with your Wilson game stack and go, you know, Wilson, Metcalf, Perriman, for example. So going a little bit outside the box, a little bit outside the box, going Rashad Perriman core play this week. Yeah, it's definitely outside the box, you know, when you talk about a gospel or a core play, just because, yep. you know, how cheap the guy is. But when you talk about his production, you know, this is a guy that I've had on my radar uh, for the last several weeks, and I've actually rostered him um, on a regular basis just because of the value um, that you get with him. And he's got the big playability, um, and the Jets are always playing from behind. So you know that they're going to have to air the ball out. So he's going to get targets. He's going to get looks. Um, I like it. Really sneaky little crappy core play, Davey. Good one. Well, I try, Patrick. There's a reason why I win all the time. I don't know if you knew <laughs> that. Uh, nope. Nope. No. Not aware of that. I tell you what, man. A lot of my notes this week are real simple, buddy. Let, let, so let me I head. Let me let me head into to my my devil this week, the guy that I'm fading. Hold on, hold on. it's funny because I'm looking at the notes, and typically the notes that are on the left side of the screen are the ones that are on the right side of the screen, and vice versa. So Dave usually writes up like six paragraphs. That's why he talks so much. Um, and today he's got like four or five sentences per guy. I, I just, I don't get it. What's up, man? Well, I didn't want to bring it up, but since you, since, since you did, Patrick, um, your mother pays me a lot of money because she thinks my voice is sexy. And Isn't so it? I just like to go on and on and on because it really, it really gets her britches going. So, um, nice. this week she said she had other, other engagements. Um, she wouldn't uh, be able to listen to the podcast and I know big Mac ain't really probably too into this. So mm-hmm. I just figured I'd keep it simple. Okay. Deal. So, Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> my my devil this week, David fucking Montgomery. Hate this guy. Sixty five hundred bucks. Bears versus Texans. He's Listen, been so good the last two games. I don't give a shit, Patrick. Listen, he, this guy has been outstanding uh, the last two weeks in smash spots. He's posted five x or better in both of those games. He has another smash spot this week against the Texans. These Texans that are giving up the second most. Fantasy or DFS points per game to running backs this year. Same as I've said over and over and over and over again about this dude. He always underperforms. Now listen, the fact that he hasn't underperformed the past two weeks and the fact that he's going to be the highest owned running back on this slate and one of the top three highest owned players this week, that's all I need to sit his ass, Patrick. Listen, if he goes off again, fantastic, all right? He just isn't someone that I will probably ever be overweight on he's not going to be a complete fade for me just like he wasn't the last couple weeks but i will be severely underweight on him again okay moving on my devil for this week i mean i just davy he's he's going up against the texans rundy the only thing worse is going up against the lions rundy i mean and and he's okay he's david montgomery he's david montgomery you're right i like 
I like your angle though. Um, you know, not playing him just because of how much, you know, exposure he's going to have. So that's going to, you know, help differentiate your lineup a little bit, but, um, man, I just, I don't see sitting him. So, but a guy I do see sitting, um, and my devil, uh, is the Minnesota Vikings running back Dalvin cook. They got the Tampa Bay Brady's this weekend and he's sitting at 9,400 bucks which is the highest price player on the entire slate this week through his first seven games this season. He was on an absolute unbelievable pace, averaging almost six yards a carry over 120 yards a game, almost two touchdowns a game, but he's just not been himself lately. Uh, over the last four games, he's averaging just three and a half yards a carry under a hundred yards a game and 0.25 touchdowns a game. He's got one touchdown in his last four. And now they travel to visit a Tampa Bay run defense that's allowed the second fewest fantasy points a game to opposing running backs over the last four weeks at just 12.7 and the fifth fewest over the course of the entire season at just over 20. I know that Delvin Cook is a special guy, and I know that he's one of these couple running backs in the league that the matchup just really shouldn't matter. Um, But that price tag this week, man, against that defense, uh, there are some way safer plays, in my opinion, at the position, um, and for thousands less than Cook. Yep. Um, I mean, your notes got in this week before mine. Uh, Dalvin Cook was going to be my my fade, and then I kind of thought it was a little bit too obvious, so even if you didn't put it in there, I wasn't going to. Um, I just, well, that's because you're so much smarter than I am. Well... I just don't understand the price tag, man. Like ninety four hundred dollars against against Tampa. I mean, I don't know, man. I I got half a mind to play him just a little bit because who who's going to play him? Like, I mean, like I talk about with Derrick Henry a lot. You know, uh, the weeks that Derrick Henry is going to be under ten percent owned, that's when I'm playing him. The weeks that he's over ten percent owned, and and fuck it, I'm not I'm not touching him. Well, Dalvin right. Cook is rarely in that situation because unlike Henry, Dalvin Cook can catch the ball. I think that's where you're kind of hoping that, you know, he's going to have to get his points from. But to be honest, man, I mean, when you got Jefferson and Thielen to, to chuck that ball around to, I'm not saying he's not going to get targets because he always does. But I think that's a lot of what you're relying on. So, I mean, if they get down and get near the goal line, obviously they're going to pound it with Dalvin. And, you know, he could easily, you know, fall in the end zone twice, get you 50 yards rushing, Six catches for sixty yards, and all, all of a sudden, you know, I, I don't, I can't do math that quick, but all of a sudden, you know, he, he's put up a, a decent day, and you're fine. But, I, yeah, he's 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 got a limited ceiling this week, I think. Yeah, speaking of guys falling down lately, why don't you tell me who your pivot is for this week? I, I like my pivot, man. My my pivot is um, Russell Wilson, man. Seventy nine hundred bucks. Seahawks versus Jets. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think he's the second highest, uh, most expensive quarterback um, this week. Listen, yep. listen. My my core play is a run back for this guy. Okay, so it, it really only makes sense that I'm going to be overweight, you know, versus the field on my dude Russ. And he struggled the past month, which has really drove down his ownership this week, um, even though he's in a really good spot against the Jets. Like a lot of things this week, man, but this play for me is simple. Listen, if I can get Russ under 8% in a smash spot against the Jets, who are giving up the fourth most points to QBs, then I'm going to do it, man. Hey, rule number one, Patrick, play good players. Give me some Russ, stack him with DK, I think my money's in good hands. Yeah, he's been, you know, and he was my core, or what was he last week for me? Contrarian you know, last week. He was my contrarian last week, yep. and he produced like one. Yeah, um, unfortunately, that <laughs> son of a bitch cost me a little bit of money there. But, yeah, but all the more reason to play him again this week. Yeah, and you're, you're not wrong, and you're right. Play good players, and the guy, although he struggled the last five weeks, is still, you know, probably the best quarterback in the NFL when you look at his tools. Um, and and he's going to come out of this funk. And unfortunately for the Jets, I, I think that you're right, and it's going to be against them. So, um, you know, my my archangel and pivot for this week um, is a wide out uh, out there uh, for the Dallas Cowgirls. Uh, they, they go to Cincinnati to play the Bengals, and it's Michael Gallup. 
uh, at thirty eight hundred bucks. Great value for this guy this week. Uh, you know, this is going to be a revenge game for the big red tomato. Um, and he's going to air it out. And uh, McCarthy's going to let him air it out. Uh, since he's been middle of the pack throughout the entire season, uh, you know, 15th to 17th, uh, 36 and a half fantasy points a game to opposing receivers. Yes, Gallup is number three in that wide receiving core, you know, behind Cooper and rookie standout CD Lamb. Um, so this is an obvious pivot from the two of them. But over the last three weeks with Andy Dalton behind center, Gallup co-leads the Cowboys with 24 targets. And he's commanding 22% of the team target share while averaging just over 12 fantasy points a game. That magic 4X threshold is an absolute possibility if Gallup can find Pater this weekend. I don't know, man. Michael Gallup has been trash. Um, the one thing that I will say, and, and I honestly... I'm a little disappointed that I didn't I didn't notice this myself, but you hit the nail on the head as far as revenge game for for Dalton. Um, I I really believe in that stuff, man. I really I really believe in in those that type of stuff. You know, like you know they showed him the door, rightfully so, and yep. you know he's going up against him this week, and he's got more targets than he ever had in Cincinnati. Um, oh, you absolutely. Know? And so, yeah, I mean, that, that does make sense. And, you know, to be honest, that does give me a little bit of a tick up on Gallup. But, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's a pivot. So, again, you know, you're not saying you're, you know, you got a core play here. But, um, yeah, I can see that. So, Golden hasn't been too bad over the last three weeks. I mean, he's he's yeah. got six touchdowns to three interceptions. It looks like he's averaging about 240, 250 yards a game. Um, so yeah, probably about I don't know seventeen fantasy points out of him the last three weeks. So he's he's trending in the right direction. All right. Well, it looks like uh, your your next two here, are K- Contreras and Hale Mary, are going to be from the same team, but or not same team from the same game. But so why don't you lead us into that Contreras man? That to me, this is always the most interesting one of the week. Um, I had a hard time with mine this week, um, as I typically do. But um, let, let's say you. All right, so my my heresy for the week is wide receiver out of Carolina, Robbie Anderson, $6,200. Uh, they got Denver coming to town. Uh, Denver has been outstanding uh, this season against opposing wide receivers. Um, seventh in the league, uh, averaging, giving up just over 34 points a game, um, and a league best over the last four weeks. Um, at just under 22 a game. Now, I saw DJ Moore and Samuel on the COVID-19 list, so they're supposed to not be playing. Uh, So that focus would primarily be on Anderson, which wouldn't appear to bode very well for him. Now, when I wrote these notes, this was totally different because of what we're starting to see now, but Run CMC is supposed to be back this weekend. That's, that's that's wrong. Just so you know, he he's he's nope, not playing this week. Doubtful. Yep. So, but yes, um, I, so yeah, I did that. I did that a couple weeks ago. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, that kind of changes everything. Um, but you know, my my thought process was, you know, with, with McCaffrey coming back, that's going to pull some of that focus away from Anderson. Um, and you know, he is ninth in the NFL in targets a game at over eight and a half. Um. So whether he's going to be the primary target and Denver's going to focus and key on him uh, the whole game, which they will now that, you know, Davis is going to be the guy in the backfield, he's still going to get nine, 10 targets, I think. Um, And the only viable option for Teddy Bridgewater uh, catching the ball um, on the outside. So I don't think he's going to be high owned at all, especially now that McCaffrey is out. so I got Robbie Anderson for Carolina. Yeah, his ownership will be interesting because I mean it's gonna go one of two ways, right? It's either gonna yes, be exactly. everybody sees it the way that I just said it, or everybody's gonna be like, well, he's the only fucking one. So I mean he's gotta get the ball. Yeah, you know? I, I think the sharper people will be in on Anderson because well, I mean, volume over matchup, right? That's rule number two. Yeah. He's yep. you know, if there's no CMC, if there's no Samuel, if there's no more. Who the fuck's he gonna throw the ball to? Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's got right. he's got to throw it at somebody. Uh, listen, give yeah. me give me fifteen targets, um, 
you know, 15 bad targets over five good ones. So, right with that, and, and then you and know, he's a good receiver. He's not a he's not a bum. Like he's a good receiver. So, yeah. and all he takes, I mean, he's a speedster. All it takes is one play. You know, like 70 yard touchdown, yeah. and him, all of a sudden there's 14 points, yeah, and, him, and you're good. And it's over. I yeah. mean. So let me get to my contrarian play here. Um, you know, tight end position is, is a spot that traditionally I like to punt anyways. Um, so I've got a really good punt tight end, I think, this week. Um, I got Cole Komet. We can call him Komet the Frog if you wish. Um, 2900 bucks. Bears versus Titans. I would like to say um, I've never heard Komet the Frog before, so... Uh, if that's the first time, I'm officially coining that phrase at 6.01 p.m. on December 11th, 2020. Uh, that's me. Uh, commit the frog year. Yeah, yeah. So, um, listen, man, I think this is a feisty little play, Patrick. Uh, Komet has taken Jimmy Graham over as the primary tight end in this Bears offense, which isn't saying a whole lot, but if nope. I'm going to fade the highly owned Montgomery, I'm looking for places in that Bears offense to attack. Allen Robinson is, you know, the obvious play. So you want to get a little bit contrarian, go ahead and slip, you know, some commit into the builds. Like I said, I think he's a great punt option at tight end, just $2,900 um, in a game that could get a little bit sneaky high scoring because the Texans don't play defense. Um, and if the Bears have to score, um, you know, a little bit because, you know, Deshaun Watson and crew are, are putting up some points. You know, this could get to be a game that is sneaky, not a shootout, but sneaky high scoring. Yeah, uh, I just don't know. Other than Allen Robinson, I don't know how you can play anybody that catches the ball when you got Trubitsky back there throwing it to him. So, Contrarian, my friend, he's going to be what, what three percent or less owned for twenty nine hundred bucks at a position yeah. that I'm punting anyways. Yeah, no, nope. hey. that's contrarian for sure. I'm not going crazy with Komet, but um, I mean, we'll we'll see what happens come Sunday morning. But I mean, he's in my player pool. You know what I mean? Like we'll see what happens, but he's in the player pool. Yeah. So our hail marys. We got a couple of wideouts. You want to go first, or you want me to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. As you know, we're contractually obligated, um, you know, as Detroit Lions fans, um, to make you know a, a <laughs> Lions player part of this every week. Um, you know, I don't know who's yeah, signing. Bucks for that, don't we? I don't know who's <laughs> signing the check anymore. Uh, Bob Quinn used to sign our checks. Um, yeah. but with him out the door, uh, I guess I'm just waiting for Daryl Bevel to return my, um, to return my MySpace message. Um, so hopefully I hear from him soon, but <laughs> I'm going Quintez Cephas. That's right. Quintez Cephas, 3,200 bucks lions against those fudge Packers. And the notes, it says, assuming that Kenny Galladay is out again, Kenny Galladay is out again. So Cephas is going to be the number two receiver in a, I don't know, decent Lions passing attack. And, I mean, they're likely to be playing catch-up this week. They will be playing catch-up this they, week. They should be playing catch-up this week. Um, listen, numbers on this guy, they're not going to be amazing, all right? But I say if you can find a near minimum price player that has a chance to get into the end zone, they are going to be in play for me. He caught a touchdown last week. Jair Alexander is going to be on Marvin Jones, opening up the field for this kid. Lions want to give him some run, closing out the year to kind of see what he can do. Could be a good spot to exploit a little bit of money saving while getting yourself a good shot to hit, you know, value. It's a Hail Mary, so you're not trying to break the slate. You're just trying to usually save some coin and, you know, get to other guys. 3200 bucks for a number two receiver that should be getting... I mean, at least that offense should be getting lots of passing um, attempts. So they may or may not go to Cephas. I don't know. But, you know, for 3200 bucks, that's what you get. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking earlier about how you're going to stack these Packers. This is a great correlation guy to save some coin on. Yes, because um, everyone is going to run it back with Hawkinson or everyone's going to run it back with Jones. Nobody is playing Quintez Cephas. Nope, so that's a good sneaky little pick. Put that one in your memory bank for sure. Um, So, yeah, man, I got a receiver as well, uh, and he's out of Denver, um, and we're going back to that game at Carolina. And I got K.J. Hamler, 
Uh, 3,000. He's the minimum. Carolina has given up the sixth most fantasy points a game to opposing receivers over the last four weeks, just over 43. In the last five games with Drew Locke under center and the likes of Judy, Patrick, and Hamler all in the lineup together, Hamler is second on the team in targets with 31 only behind Judy, collecting 27% of that target share. Drew Locke also leads the NFL at 9.4 yards intended air yards per pass attempt and is ninth in the league at 6.4 completed air yards per pass attempt. Although Locke has been pressured on nearly 24% of his dropbacks this year, he's only been sacked 11 times, Dave. He moves around the pocket, and he's always looking downfield to make a big play. Coupled with the fact that Carolina is the fifth fewest sacks in the league against opposing quarterbacks. Dang, man. You know, I, I when I was going through this, I kind of talked myself into playing some Drew Locke this week at just 5100 bucks for a quarterback spot. And, and you look at the numbers, and it makes sense. But going back to the Hail Mary with Hamler, you know, the speedy second rounder is also handling the punt return duties for Denver now and is fully capable of breaking one at any given moment. If he does, that's plus six. Hell, maybe even double down with the Denver defense this week at $2,500. They're sixth in the NFL of sacks, 32. Hail Mary, there's three of them in there. Now, two. Um, so did you just say you're playing Drew Locke this week against me? Is that is that what's happening? Yeah, I kind of did. Oh my god! Do we? Uh, all right, listen. I'm gonna need so I'm gonna you to. Do, I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you my three. I'm gonna give you my three guys in our lineup. I already. I can tell you three. I already know who they are. It's gonna be Drew Lock, KJ and, Hamler, and Robbie and Anderson. Robbie Anderson. Yeah. So, are you gonna play any good players in this week, or are you just gonna roll out a bunch of guys like that? Yeah. Um. I'll probably play Delvin Cook, who I think <laughs> is gonna suck, just because when I think <laughs> somebody sucks. They do really well. Yeah. Um. So, so that'll give me a chance, you know, to to save a little money with some of these other guys. Hey, who else do you um, think sucks this week? Throw them all in one lineup. I'll have Michael Gallup in there. You know what? Maybe I'll just put my team in there, Dave. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe I'll go with Drew Locke, yep. KJ Hamler, the Denver defense, yep. Robbie Anderson, Mike Gallup, Dalvin Cook, Aaron Jones. What do I got? A flex spot left? Uh, James Stewart. Wide receiver. What do I got left? Put put James Stewart in either either James Stewart. No, and then I'll put I'll I'll get Montgomery in there somehow. What about David Sloan? I'll put Montgomery in there somehow with Jason Hanser. I'm gonna <laughs> put him in as my kicker. <laughs> well, at least he got one. We got one Hall of Famer. <laughs> Patrick, this this has gone off the rails. Um, this is ridiculous, and I like it. I appreciate it. I also appreciate everyone for listening to us again here. Uh, week 14, Sunday School NFL DFS Podcast. We are getting very close to the end of the season. Um, two episodes are left. Um, we're not going to do Week 17 because Week 17 is fucking batshit crazy. Um, and well, I don't know, Patrick, you're batshit crazy. Maybe you can do a solo Week 17. Oh, geez. Nobody will listen. Well, your mom will listen, Patrick. That's if she not has any, That's if I allow her any free time. Dave, not without your voice. We went over this earlier. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll just change the logo to like a picture of my six pack, and then she'll there like, then she'll listen. Perfect. I'd mute probably, but she'll listen. It's a view. Joe will be yeah. happy that we got a view. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Any any parting thoughts of what people should not do this week, Patrick? Uh, don't listen to me. All right. All right. Done deal. With that, I will go ahead and close it out. I wish everyone the best of luck. Week 14 is my favorite week. That is my favorite number. So odds are I'm going to win a million dollars and move to the Bahamas this weekend. Um, so, Patrick, you're going to have to lead the show from now on. Um, I don't know. I wish you the best of luck, my friend. I hope that that really happens, Dave. That would be awesome. And good luck, everybody. <laughs>